um, we were talking about um, godliness with contentment is great gain and what it means to be content and uh, what it means to be able to not get caught in the snare of greed and what greed does to people. Uh, when Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil, what he's saying is the root of all evil is, is based upon how people think about money in the world. And if you follow the money, as they say, you always find yourself <laughs> you know, going to the same source. There's always money behind it, somewhere along the line. You say, well, some guys want power. They don't want money. No, they want power and money, okay? The money gets them the power. Uh, I don't know if you uh, see these guys right now uh, on Wall Street and what they're doing and the things that are happening uh, in, in Washington. And you start looking at some of this stuff and you go, something's happening and I'm not sure what it is, but I'm not sure I want to know what's happening. So... I'm not very geopolitical, but I can tell you this. Uh, in all the history of our presidents, the guy that held the record for executive orders, writing executive orders, uh, was George Bush. He did 68 of them in his eight-year period. Uh, Obama has now written over 1,000 executive orders. And what happens when you write an executive order is you just bypass the Congress. So you don't need them. You just write, here it is. It's an executive order. And uh, that's a very, very strange way to run this country. And yet all the people who are complaining about it are doing it so quietly, and so they're just peeping about it because they don't want to be axed, okay? So here it goes. And uh, so just remember that this issue we're going to talk about today, about filthy lucre and about some of these things. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Let's get started here, and we're going to get into this, and I hope we can get all this done in, in just 45 or 50 minutes. It's good to have everybody here today. It's good to have Bob and Ruby, Mark, from uh, Inverness, oh, no, excuse me, Brooksville, excuse me, I'm sorry. You've now made the transition fully. Uh, Jay is here, and his boy Aaron, is he in the back? Okay, Jay, it's good to have you here, and Aaron, uh, he's back there with the other kids. So we're glad to have you all here today. Turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and look at verse 18. Paul says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And it is, isn't it? People that are unsaved don't think that uh, what we're doing here is of any value. They don't think it's of any great thing. He says, it is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. And I think that's great because the gospel begins in Romans 1, and Paul says, it is the power of God, what? To get you saved. Look over at Romans chapter 1. How do you get saved? You come to the church, well, how do I get in? Some of you might have been here before when the door gets shut and the magnet thing is not over the thing and, and they can't get in. I, sometimes we come here and, and we're setting up in here, and until I put that little thing over the magnet, you can't get in the place. You have to hit a code to get in, and they do that for security. And you say, well, I'm here at the church, but I can't get in. I've heard that several times. You know, It's like I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, I'm here at the church, I can't get in. Well, how do you get into the church? Well, Paul says it this way. He says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. And it's revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. All men in every age from the beginning to the end are justified by faith. All men. All men are saved and justified by faith. However, not all men believe the same gospel message you and I believe. Abraham believed the gospel, didn't he? But he did not believe that Christ died on the cross for his sins. He believed that when he looked at the stars of, of the heavens, that God had told him that I'm going to make your family like those stars. And I'm going to make of you a great nation. And I'm going to make, a, I'm going to make this whole thing happen with setting up a family. And this whole thing that we're going to do is going to be through your family that I'm going to make. 
and he had no idea what he was talking about. Because he was an old man who had, didn't have any children, didn't have any heirs, and all of a sudden, he thought that was great, and he believed it. And in Genesis 15, 6, Paul quotes it in Romans 4, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. The promise made to Abraham was that I'm going to make of you a great nation. And that great nation would eventually be the nation through which the Messiah would come. It is the seed of David through which the Lord Jesus Christ comes. You go to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, what does it say? Jesus Christ, the son of who? David. Now, Paul makes it clear that his gospel message, okay, is based upon the idea of the son of David. The idea that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he says, of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. What he's saying is that the message that I preach today in the dispensation of grace, this message that Christ gives him about the cross, includes something about the throne of David. What is that? Well, Jesus Christ is a descendant through lineage of King David. Now, he's born without a human father, yes, but both his adopted father and his natural mother both come from King David. They're part of that lineage. And that lineage in Luke and that lineage in Matthew takes the Lord Jesus Christ lineage all the way back to Abraham, all the way back to Adam. Now, this whole message that Abraham believed had nothing to do with the cross. But Abraham did understand that he was going to have to be resurrected if he's going to live in a kingdom. He looked for a city whose founder and maker was God, it says. And if you're going to live for eternity, if you're going to live way out there in a kingdom or live in a kingdom eternally, what must you come to understand? That you, you're going to have to be resurrected. You can't, everybody knows the one basic thing you learn in life is that you die. So if you're going to live forever with God, there must be some way God is going to make this happen, and that's going to be through Jesus Christ. And Paul's talking about this, and Abraham had this faith, and when it comes over here, the Lord Jesus Christ had the faith to do what he did, and then we have to have the faith to believe what he tells us. The faith of Christ is for him to do it. Did he do it? You say, well, why would God have to have faith? Because God, in the person of Jesus Christ, is a man. And he lived his entire life by faith. He lived his entire life on the complete de dependency of his Father. And he had made an agreement with God the Father, and God the Father had made an agreement with him, and God the Holy Spirit agreed with both of them, and they all three agreed that this was the only possible way that we are ever going to get mankind savable is to go die for them. The only way they're going to get saved in this new program in which they're savable is that they have to believe the gospel. Now, the gospel does not include you doing anything. It didn't include anything for Abraham to do, and it doesn't include anything for you to do. Notice in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. It's revealed beautifully in the gospel because it teaches you that, first of all, not only is it by faith without works, but it's always been by faith without works. And I can tell you wholeheartedly that I disagree with anybody who says different than that, that says that, they can, that you've got to do this and then you've got to perform some work of any kind, whether it be under the law or before the law or in the dispensation of grace or even out here in the future. When you got saved back here under the law, you were never saved by the law, but you could be saved while you lived under it, you see. I mean, let's face it, people, all the Jews did not go to hell for 1,500 years just because they couldn't keep the law. That, you, you don't go to hell because you can't keep the law. God made a provision for them. God makes a provision for you. Under that program, they had to do some things that were physical in nature in their service for God but not to get eternal life and not to be justified. When they died back here, it, there was no question about whether they were going to go to paradise or whether they were going to go to torments. None whatsoever. That's always in the Bible decided before a man dies. It's never decided after. 
So when a man back here lived his life under the law, he had some things he had to understand about that law that it should have taught him that would teach him about a coming redeemer who was coming here and that he would have understood that he needed that redeemer in order to get re eternal life. Redemption is essential. Read the book of Ruth and you will learn about the concept and laws of redemption in Israel. This was not secret. It was not kept secret from them. They understood that they needed to have a redeemer. By the way, when you understood that you needed a redeemer, that was the schoolmaster of the law teaching you the lesson that you needed to learn before you could get justified. Isn't that the way it is today? The first thing you can do, uh, the first thing you must do before you get saved is realize that you're lost. And so that's what Paul's saying. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And he says, But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Well, sometimes you don't hear the gospel clearly. Look over 2 Corinthians, please, in chapter 4. People don't hear the gospel. Why? Because the people that are entrusted with preaching the gospel are too busy trying to take the money of the people they're preaching to. Watch Christian television, and if you don't learn anything from it, other than they don't have a clear gospel message, is that they're trying to get your money. Now, I'm just going to say it out loud. I, I don't have anything they can kick me out of. Now, if you ever watch the Irish preacher up here in North County, uh, this guy with the hat on, you ever see him? Um, I can't remember his name now, but uh, I, I was... Leslie Hale, yes. Leslie Hale, the first time Leslie Hale came here, when he first came here, he really started giving the TV preachers a hard time. And he was talking about him taking the money too. And of course, that's what he's doing. But he, he's doing the same thing. But he's at least preaching a clear gospel message. Well, they kicked him off the television station. And then he, I guess he made amends with them and he got back on and he, and he quit talking like that. But I'm going to tell you, he really got on their case about it. And he said their gospel they're preaching on this station is not clear. I mean, he's biting the hand that was feeding him. But the guy that was feeding him was worth $750 million. And, you know, that's what you do when you start a Christian television station, is you make a lot of money. And the people that are on there make a lot of money. And so because they spend all their money staying on TV so they can make more money so they can stay on TV so they can make more money. When they're making lots of money, what are you going to make off of them if you've got the station? Lots of money. Follow the money. It's always there. Paul says, but if our gospel be hid, verse 3, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. These guys are not going to get in trouble for just fleecing the flock. They're going to get in trouble for not preaching the right gospel message. That's it. And he says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. That's exactly what they're doing. They're preaching that they can heal you. They, they're saying that they're going to give you a return on your money if you send it. You're going to sow it, and then you're going to sow that seed. <laughs> You've heard that nonsense. And, and that, that you're going to sow it, and, you, and it's going to come right back to you. In Wall Street, that's called a dividend. That's called an earnings. That's taxable. Do you pay taxes on the blessings God gives you? Does God have to bless you that way today? We already went through this before in the greed part of this, but when you see people trying to demonstrate that blessings come to you based on anything you do, whether it be working for the church, in the church, around the church, ministry, whatever, or whether you're doing good deeds or whether you're giving money to charity or whatever. When you find people, especially in Christendom, if you find people that think that God blesses you and brings gain into your life in any way, 
And that includes the healing. If you think that that's going on, Paul says for you to get away from them, stay away from them, because they don't understand the concept of the cross. And if you go out and preach it wrong, then what will it naturally be to the people who are listening? It will be hid. Why? Because Satan is blinding their eyes. He's blinding the minds, he says, of them which believe not. Look at Acts chapter 26. You know, Paul didn't get this from somebody else. Paul got this from the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 is exactly what Paul is learning in Acts 26. If you go to Acts 26, Paul is talking directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ is talking right back to him. And there is a conversation going on, and Paul is giving his testimony, and as he tells his, gives his testimony to Agrippa, this is, this is Herod's great-great, this is Herod's great-grandson. That's who this is. Herod the Great's great-grandson. And he's, he's teaching him about the gospel, and he's telling him what happened to him in his conversion. And notice the conversation in verse uh, 15, when Saul, who's just been knocked off his horse by a bright light that's, that's exceeding the brightness of the sun, verse 15, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? Is that you? Because usually... When you see bright lights and you get knocked off your horse, that's, that's God talking to you. Because he's already said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? <laughs> I mean, you, it doesn't take that Jew long to put that together, okay? And he says, and he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Not a good first thing to hear from God. See, you never had to listen to that, did you? From Jesus Christ. No. He says in verse 16, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. He's testifying right here about what he had seen, and he will continue to get these revelations from Jesus Christ all the way through his ministry. Jesus Christ speaks to Saul, who later becomes Paul the Apostle, many times. He is recounting this. If you go back to Acts chapter 22, you'll hear him recount again what happened to him. And he talks about the trouble he got into when he went to Jerusalem when he wasn't supposed to. Then in verse 17, he says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Look at verse 18 closely. He says, To open their eyes. How do you open people's eyes? Do you have them invest their hard-earned money promising them no return when you, or promising them a return when you know there will be no return? That the return is actually going to be in your pocket when you lie in such a way that they just keep believing it every week and every month and they just keep writing the checks and, oh, God's blessing me. Come up and touch the TV and get the blessing. I got a pair of prayer socks one time from a guy. Well, Carla's dad got them. He got them in the mail, these black socks, and you're supposed to put the socks on, and then you put the Bible on the floor, and you stand up on top of your Bible, and you recite this prayer. And I read the whole thing. We did it. We did it in the living room. We were laughing about it. And it was like, th this is how hilarious some of these things are. And as you think about some of these things, you say, you know, I sent that guy the money, and, and some things are going my way now. When you start thinking that way, you know what you're doing? You're denying Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Here's what God says about his blessings to you. Here's what he says in black and white right here on the page. Verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings. Where are they? They're in the heavenly places. So can you borrow against them to buy your house? No. Now you used to be able to go give your baptism certificate and they'd give you a mortgage in the old days. But that's not happening anymore, not at Bank of America. Okay. <laughs> right? So they're, they're a little bit different now because 
as you look at your blessings, you have to understand Gentiles are kind of dumb about blessings because they've never had any from God. God was always blessing Israel back here. And he blessed them when they did right and, and they did what he said and obeyed him. And then when they didn't, he cursed them. Okay? Well, the Gentiles just got one long cursing from the Tower of Babel all the way up to right there. They didn't have a chance. Gentiles that came and talked to the Lord Jesus Christ, he just ignored her. You remember that lady? He, the Seraphonician woman, he just ignored her. He said he answered her not a word. And the apostles are going, would you get rid of her? She crieth after us. They weren't crying after the apostles. She was crying after the Lord. And she did get an audience with him. And she did have a chance to explain herself. And she did come up with her tail between her legs like a dog. And she came up there and she began to talk to him. And he says, you know, I have, never, I have not seen so great a faith in all of Israel. The dog, the Gentile dog, knows more about the kingdom and about what's going on than the Jews did. You know what he does? He gives her the blessing. He reaches right out, here he is, right out over the dispensation of grace over here into this kingdom, and he gives, him some, gives her something that she's not going to get until she gets over there. You know why he did that? Because he could. And he's God. But that's a rare case. In the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not go to Gentiles. The apostles did not go to Gentiles. This never happened until all the way over here when Jesus Christ meets Saul of Tarsus and he says, I'm going to send you far hence to the Gentiles. The gospel is hid today because the money-grubbing, filthy lucre preachers are keeping people from hearing it because they want to get their money. If they start telling them that the gospel is free and that they've got all their blessings up front and that they don't have to give 10% or 15% or, or 20% or whatever or, or, or sow their seed, if they just give on the honor system by free will cheerfully, they'll be fine. They're afraid people are going to go on and just be cheerful and not give anything. Isn't that what people do? They just sometimes forget. They're so wrapped up. <laughs> they're so wrapped up in financial matters that they can't think about the ministry. Filthy lucre is this. It's gain in money or goods, profit. It says Webster says usually in an ill sense or with the sense of something base or unworthy. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What does it mean to be base? Somebody I know, very dear to me, said, he's, I, we were talking about this passage, he goes, I'm like that. 1 Corinthians 1, I said, what? We are talking about lewd fellows of the baser sort. And he said that's what he was. I said, you are not that way. Why do you have that view of yourself? And he was down. He was just thinking of himself like he was just trash. You know, I'm thinking, what? whoa, whoa, stop. What does Paul say? What he's going to say is the world's going to think you're the off-scouring bums of the world. The, 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 the Christians that need the crutches to get through life, and they've got to have some hokey religion to get them through. You're the people that believe all the stuff on TV. You're the people who... Kick your kids, whippers, people who whip their children. Okay, you're people that are doing these things, and, and you're, a bunch of, you're a bunch of weirdos. And you'll have to carry that moniker with you. Probably it's going to get worse, but sometimes that's what happens. Well, here's what he says, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh... Not many mighty, not many noble are called. That means that not many people in those categories are saved. If you go back and look at Agrippa and you look at Felix that Paul was talking to in the book of Acts when he's trying to get these kings saved, when he talked about righteousness and judgment to come, what did Felix do? He trembled, didn't he? Yeah, no, they don't believe it and they don't want to believe it. He says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world that's what they think we are, foolish, and that the Bible's a foolish book. The little, the little flock is called the foolish nation in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not because they're foolish, but because the world thinks they're foolish. He says, 
the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Well, that's what you are. What does Paul say about being weak? When I'm weak, I'm what? I'm strong. 2 Corinthians 12. When I'm weak, I'm strong. When I quit relying upon me and rely upon what he says and him living in me, wow, that's when I find the strength that I need. That's why Paul says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, not yours. So he says, and base things of the world. So when he says the base things of the world and things which are despised hath, what? God chosen. So you're not the base things. You're not the lewd fellows of the baser sort that Paul was talking about in Acts that were after him and after Jason and after all the rest of them. They, no, he's talking about they think you're that way. That's how they picture you. You're not considered somebody that is, well, you're just not electable. Isn't that right? That's why these guys don't talk about the Lord Jesus Christ when they say they're Christians and they're going to run for office. They keep all that stuff quiet because they won't elect me. Well, so what? He says, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. What are the things which are not? You. See, you, you're not thought very highly by the rich. You get with the super rich and you meet these people who got so much money they can't even, they don't even know from day to day what they're worth. When they've got so much money, are you more, are you likely to go out to lunch with those people? Eat a $5,000 lunch? $2,000 lunch? You want to go on the yacht? He says, well, you let me, I want to go on your yacht. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, okay, you don't hang out with those people, do you? You know why? They don't want to hang out with you. You know why? Because you're not like them. He says, to bring to naught things that are. Now, that's who's going to make it happen. Let me tell you something. This world right here that we live in, here in the dispensation of the grace of God, is going to come to an end the minute Jesus Christ takes the church, the body of Christ out. And when that happens, this blue section right here, when it starts, that period right there before this great tribulation begins, this, this wrath period, this seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, that whole thing is going to be the world system in a situation that it's never been in before. This is worse than before the flood of Noah. It's, well, I guess maybe you look at it and you say, what makes it so bad? The Bible clearly says through predictive prophecy that it's, there's never been a time like it and there's never going to be a time like it after that. The two great events in the Bible that you look at that seem horrible are the flood and the great white throne, the judgment of all the lost. But this is not going to hell. This is when hell comes up and is here. And when we leave and the Holy Spirit in us goes and takes us out of here, the Lord takes us out and gives us our new body, the world is left unto itself. And when it's left unto itself, you find out that things aren't going to go well for them. It's going to be a bad deal. You remember the big scare a, lot, a while back when they wrote those books called Left Behind and Left Behind 2. Those are the hokiest movies I've ever seen in my life. You ever watch one of those? I can't even get through one of those things. I tried to watch it not too long ago. I said, I'm going to watch this thing. Somebody keeps talking about this. I watch it. I go, this is ridiculous. Click. They didn't even understand the basic premise of what's going on in that thing. Today, the Christian world wants us to go into that. Why? Because they want to sell you stuff so that you can survive through it. They got shows on TV about this, okay? They're going to sucker you in to buying five-gallon buckets of beans, okay? And they're going to get your money. Don't listen to that stuff. I'm telling you right now, it's filthy lucre. The base things here are not you and I, but they think we are. Paul says that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye, notice, in Christ Jesus. It's great to be in Christ. He says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who are of God, 
who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You know the plan of God and the wisdom of the mystery. You got righteousness imputed to your account. Now you've justified, you've been justified and declared righteous by God. You're set apart for an intended purpose that God has for you in this dispensation of grace and in the future. And you've been redeemed. He says, verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, what? Let him glory in the Lord. Not in how much money they're making. Because if you see all of this, crystal palaces and prayer palaces everywhere, you say, oh, this has got to be of God. This is of God doing this. Can I tell you that where you're at right here is of God? But those who would come in and, and watch what we do here would say, I've had them over the years. I'm telling you, many of them. And I had a guy here, he came here and he kept wanting to do this, you know. So what you looking at, Ray? What's going on up there on the ceiling? And uh, he sat, well, where we used to meet, he would be sitting right about where Ruby sit. And he'd be sitting there, and he'd be doing it every week. And he came up and he offered some suggestions on what kind of songs we ought to preach. Charismaniac mantras is what he was talking about. <laughs> Here we go. Our God is an awesome God. Let's sing that 400 times. Okay, great. I think he knows that by now. Okay. You know, they're going to do that. And he wanted all that. Well, he, when he quit coming, I said, Ray, aren't you learning anything? You coming back? Are you going to? He says, no. He says, he says, that place you're at is dead. <laughs> I said, dead? I said, what do you mean? He goes, there's just no action there. I said, really? Okay. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to, he wanted to get up and run around and do the kind of stuff that they do. And so he found him a place like that. He had come out of a place like that, so he wanted to go back. And as the dog returns to his vomit, <laughs> that's how he does it, okay? You just go right back to it. You see, when they get this information, they believe it, they suck it up. And while these kinds of things are usually reserved for politicians and corrupt leadership and convicts and criminals and those who cheat, steal, and rob for a living, not always openly, some are they're covert, but even now we see the, the cyber criminals doing this stuff, you know, stealing from us. And the mob says, well, we're getting into that business and that's what they're doing. And so they want to steal your identity. But the worst is the TV preacher, in my mind. Because what he's doing is he's preying on people that are weaker, that are desperate, some of them lost, most of them probably. And they're willing to stand there in their pulpits. And, 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 and most of the time when they're trying to do this, they don't do it in a big crowd. They do it a close camera shot at a desk, and they're just trying to work the crowd. Okay? You have to get over this. Okay? And uh, one of the reasons that uh, I, I think one of the first things people should learn, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, one of the first things Christians should learn is how to give. And the way we teach that here at Suncoast is we put our offering bucket on the back table. I, I, we take a lot of criticism for this. But people say, you ought not to be ashamed to take an offering. We're not ashamed to take an offering. What we're trying to do is get people to learn how to give an offering from here. Okay? Willingly, regularly, sacrificially, cheerfully. That's how it should be done. And honestly, if you can't do that, please don't do it. Now... In the ministry, if you go back into the gospel messages back here that Jesus Christ was sending the 12 apostles out with the gospel of the kingdom under this gospel ministry here, what did he tell them about taking an offering? Just keep your place in 1 Corinthians 9. Go back to Matthew 10. And he says something very interesting in Matthew 10 when he sends the apostles out. What does he tell them to do? Jesus Christ is going to send these men out in Matthew 10 to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He's going to continue the ministry that John had started. He calls 12 disciples, 10-1, and then notice what he says in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go, ye, uh, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Clear who they were to go to. 
And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And they could do all that because they were doing it based on the Davidic covenant. And here's the son of David, and he's going to come to set up the kingdom. So what are they going to do in the kingdom? That's what they're going to do in the kingdom. Those people are going to eat of trees in that kingdom that keeps them alive through that whole kingdom. They're not going to die. They're going to, have, they're going to be able to sustain themselves. There's, there are things going on in, in, in Matthew 10 that are directly related to what? Not this, but to this. In other words, we're just not in view yet. So what does he say? He says, freely ye have received, freely what? Give. They didn't have all things in common at this time because if you'll notice verse 9, he says, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. You see, they were to lead people to the Lord and then through those people, they would have hospitality given to them to meet their needs for their meals and their, where they're going to sleep and where they're going to bathe and those kind of things. In other words, we'd invite them in. We talk. We get saved. We say, stay. We want you to stay. Now, if you don't get any of those kind of people doing that, then you sleep under a tree and don't eat. So you're not going out to do this with the kind of financing that, that most people would presume that this is going to, going to have behind it. They didn't live that way, okay? The Bible says that the Son of Man hath not a place to lay his head. The Lord Jesus Christ was not a homeowner. He was homeless. Not in the sense that we see homeless people today because he's down and out. It's because when he's in the world, he's in his world, okay? And he knows where to stay and he knows what to eat and he knows what to do, okay? So his apostles did not starve and their families did not starve. Under this ministry, they were provided for while that was going on. Now, you notice... This changes somewhat. Go over to uh, Acts chapter 9. And there's a change that takes place. Keep your place in 1 Corinthians there. We're going we're gonna to go back to that in just a little bit when we close here. We're just about ready to close in just a few minutes. Acts chapter 9. And Acts chapter 11. Go to Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 11. When Saul gets saved, he goes to Ananias' house and then he goes into Damascus and he preaches and he gets in trouble. Then he goes to Jerusalem and they were all afraid of him. Look at verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. It says they were all afraid. Not one of them believed who he was. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. That is how Saul had seen the Lord. We just read about it in Acts 26. He says, and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Well, he got in trouble there too. He was three years preaching there and the Jews tried to kill him there too. Okay. Now look at verse 28. And he was with them, the apostles, coming in and going out, where? At Jerusalem. He's numbering himself with them, identifying himself with their ministry, because after all, if you, if you go and go on a tirade and kill 20,000 people in God's kingdom church or bring them to prison or whatever, all of them they didn't kill, evidently, but it is said they might have killed at least 20,000. So if he had done this in this, this time of this reign of terror, he was clearly in need of some public relations, wouldn't you say? He had a PR problem. He needed some credibility, and the 12 apostles is the only place he's going to get it with Christian people, with believers, Jewish Christians. So, but if you'll notice in verse 29, 
while he was there, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now here he is speaking at Jerusalem, and it says, and disputed against the Grecians. We, we looked at this this morning, but they went about to slay him. And then they brought him down to Caesarea. Now notice verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Why? Why did they have the rest? Because he got saved. They all had rest. They go, Phew. he's not chasing us, he's preaching for us now. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. Now go over to Acts chapter 11 after this goes on for a while. This group down in Antioch that he had chased out of Jerusalem, they go down there. And because of this great famine in the days of Claudius Caesar, if you look at verse 27, I want you to notice something here. Verse 29. I'm in Acts 11, 27, 28, 29, right through there. There's a, there's a, there's a dearth or a famine going to come. And in verse 29, then the disciples, every man, according to his what? What do these disciples do? These are not just members of the body of Christ. They're a mixture of both people that have been put into the body of Christ who's the ministry of, of Paul and their kingdom saints that Saul had run off in Acts 8 and 9 that ran down to Antioch. So they're working together. So you know what Saul does when he finds these people? He explains to him what has happened to him and what was going on and they began to work together because, as I said before, they're not just going to give up. They got a mission. But their program has been what? What happened to their program? It got postponed. So what do you do if you're going along and Saul runs you out of Jerusalem and you run down to Antioch and you're safe and you meet Saul of Tarsus? Well, that's the guy that was chasing us. But he's saved now. And he turns that church around and he turns it into a gospel preaching church. But I want you to notice how they were taking offerings. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt at Judea. Why were they in need of money? Well, there was a famine, but they had already divested themselves over here in Acts chapter 5. You remember Ananias and Sapphira when they sold their property and they, didn't, they lied about how much they got for it? That's when Israel's offering went from about 38% under the law to 100%, and with the 12 apostles, it had already gone to 100%. So these people over here start having all things in common, and they have to have a warehouse full of goods because everybody brings it to the warehouse, and then the people in the warehouse got to distribute it every day, and they put tables out like this, and... The apostles were standing there giving the stuff out, and they said, we don't have time for this. We've got to study and do the work of the ministry. So they hired seven guys, or they picked seven guys. Stephen was one of them. Philip was another. And they, they had these guys give all this stuff out every day. A lady called me this week, and she said she came up from Miami on a domestic violence problem. Her husband was chasing her. She says, i got two weeks I'm go I got enough to stay here for two weeks in a hotel, and uh, I got a newborn. And I need diapers, and I need some formula, and I need some food for my boys. I said, well, how old are your boys? She said, 10. They're twins. She got a pair of 10-year-old boys with her and a newborn, and she's in a, she's in a hotel. So I, I, I called Casa, and I talked to them about it, and they said, yeah, we'll take care of that. And I, I put them together. I couldn't help them. Okay, our, our resources here can't do that. But I can tell you this, if we had it, we would have. She didn't know what to do. You know what she needed? She needed her husband saved. She probably needed to get saved. Okay, the idea is that people are, that are in need, they have to be taken care of. But notice how these people did it from Antioch under Saul's, Paul's ministry now. Every man according to his ability. That's not the same as having all things in common. That means that things are changing, you see. 
And now there's a new kind of war on. The war now is not about Satan trying to stop this kingdom. It's about Satan trying to stop the church, the body of Christ, from filling up. And that's been going on for 2,000 years. 1,979 years, exactly. Pretty, pretty close. And as you look at it, you say, ah, so my goal now, turn to 1 Corinthians 9, my goal now is not to have all things in common and give it all to the TV preacher like he says we're supposed to be doing, but our goal now is to give willingly, cheerfully, regularly, sacrificially, whatever, but primarily giving under grace is a part of being motivated by grace because grace will motivate you. Now look what Paul says. This is pretty interesting. He starts out in uh, chapter 9. We're not going to read all this, but he says, uh, verse 5. He says, have we not power to lead about a sister? He's talking about the ministry and his leadership. Him and the men that are working with him. A wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord. I mean, Peter had a wife, didn't he? I mean, I don't know if he didn't. He's in trouble because he's got a mother-in-law that the Lord had to heal. Okay. So what's he doing? Well, he's, he's working with the Lord for three and a half years and his family was being taken care of. So Paul says, don't we have the right to do that too? As the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? He says, Are we, do we not possess the, the, the commissioning power that Jesus Christ gives us to not have to do secular work? Did, did Saul work secular work? Yeah. He did not do that because he wanted to. He did it because the people at Corinth were doing what they shouldn't have been doing, and they were denying that he was an apostle and that he was only in it for the money. So what could he do but work? And while he was there, these poor little churches who had, they didn't have... <laughs> They didn't have anything. They're sending him relief, and they're sending him funds. And the Philippians, the poor Philippians, when they just, they were, they were giving out of their poverty, and they were so excited when the Corinthians were turning the corner and finally thinking about giving up some of their money and helping with the ministry, you know what they did? They gave more. They gave what they didn't have, Okay. So it's, a, it's amazing to me how the doctrine controlled the lives of certain people in the body of Christ at this time and how the other ones, when they just opened their wallets, just butterflies came out. There wasn't any help at all for Paul. There's no room and board. There's no travel money. There's no money. For, and, and, you know, the Philippians, you see, we saw this before in Philippians 4, he's in jail and they're sending him gifts, care packages. I packed quite a few care packages. Uh, since our boy's in North Dakota, he needs them. And he likes the Amish cinnamon bread. He likes the cookies. And he can bake all that stuff himself. I mean, he's, he's learning to be a cook. He has to. <laughs> but he likes it because we send it to him. You see, the, the thinking is here now that Paul asks the question in verse 7. He says, Who goes to war, who goes to a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of that flock, of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. When he's pulling the cart through the corn, take his muzzle off of him so that he can eat. And if he wants to eat, let him eat. That's fair. Okay? He says, Doth God take care for oxen? Or, hath, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, he says. No doubt. This is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. 
If we have sown unto you spiritual things, he tells the Corinthians, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Is it that big of a deal for you to help us? You see that, that, that frustration here. He says, if others be partakers of this power over you, well, who's that? That's the TV preachers. They didn't have TV preachers, but they had guys they were hiring to bring in to preach, and they're coming in, and they're looking like them. They're dressed real good, looking real nice. That's that question I put up on the board, would Jesus wear a Rolex? Well, if he's preaching at Corinth, he would have. No, he wouldn't have. And neither would Paul. You see, nevertheless, he says... If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather, should we not rather be able to take that power also? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest you should hinder, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. We don't want anybody saying we're here for the money and we're going to work and we are not. We're determined not to take a nickel from you tightwads because you don't get it yet. You know what John says about this? I, I love this. Look over look over at 3 John. You don't think you don't go to 3 John thinking he's going to say something about Paul. But he does. And he says and Peter says something about him also. But what does John say? I think this is fantastic. He's speaking about Paul. He says in verse 5, 3 John 5, he says, Beloved, thou dost, doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because for... Uh, because that for his name's sake, they went forth, what? Talking about Paul and his group. Taking, verse 7, nothing of the Gentiles. What was he saying in Matthew 10 when he sent out the apostles? Freely ye have received, freely give. Don't take an offering from the people you're preaching to. In Christendom, if, if you get everybody together, that's the first thing they want to do. What do you think the mega church is for? What do you think there's five and 10,000 people in one, under one roof for? You know what that's for? One thing. It's just like the, the reason they want stadiums with 80,000 people. I mean, who's going to play football in front of 500 people? High schoolers? Yeah. But they don't get paid, okay? You got to do a donation at the gate, don't you? To help them. You got to buy their hot dogs to help them. You got to do all that stuff to help them because they're just trying to keep the program going. But when you go to Tampa Stadium and you go over to Ray J and you go over there and buy those tickets and you do all that stuff, there's 75, 80,000 people over there. At the end of the day, the receipts are pretty hefty. And the, and the rights to film it are pretty hefty. The TV rights, the cable rights, all that money is so incredible. And they do it, that's why they build it, okay? And it's the same way today that it's always been. Greed runs the world. And it runs it here, even in the church. And this is what John's trying to get. He says, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers, what? Of the truth. There's some people right there helping Paul. Because they know and they understand that his ministry is now bona fide and it's moving on and they can't do anything else but help him. They have their own ministry, yes. Have you ever noticed how Hollywood likes to use biblical words when they name their movies? Like Armageddon, Kingdom of Heaven, they use the word apocalypse, which is not a Bible word, but it's, they get the meaning. Anything to sell a ticket. And they trade on God's name. We just went through the Christmas season. What did everybody do? 
How many times do you think the word Christmas was used at Christmas time? What's the first thing in Christmas is what? I'm not still on this, but I just want to tell you something. That right there, that's put into print a lot. It's mentioned and said a lot. Why? Because there's Christmas savings and there's Christmas sales and there's Christmas leftovers, and there's Christmas everything. And you know what it is? It's Christmas lucre is what it is. It's filthy lucre. Now, when this filthy lucre comes into the church, turn over to 1 Timothy. Paul warns Timothy about this. When, he, when, you, when you're going to choose a preacher, and a preacher's going to go into the ministry, this is one thing he better sort out, okay? Who he's going to serve. Look at verse 3. Not given to wine... Uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, not sinless, blameless. Make sure you don't put sinless in there, because that puts me out, okay? He says, the husband of one wife, <coughs> vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of what? Filthy lucre. Now, what about his helpers? Go down to verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. <laughs> That's pretty clear, isn't it? Look at Titus chapter 1. Verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Okay? What are these guys doing? Well, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you'll see that here they kind of look like the church, but they're lost, okay? Most of Christendom, most of the megachurches, most of the people that you see out there in Christendom, are, the, the leadership has no idea what the gospel is. I say, well, it's, it's hid because they, the, they're trying to spend their time giving money. I'm going to tell you really why it's hid, is they don't know it either. They don't know the gospel. And what they're preaching is a social gospel. It has to do with you doing the right thing, and the right thing is to give me the money. That's it. And, and, and notice what he says here. Here's what they are. Verse 4, they're traitors. Number one, heady, high-minded. Now these are really, this whole, this whole section, as I said at the conference, is talking about lost people. This is talking about the world and how it's going to go. But let me tell you something. The difference between the church, that what we see at Christendom today in the world, you can't tell the difference. He says, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's why they want the money, for the pleasures. Okay? And he says, having a form of godliness... They don't have godliness, they have a form of it. But denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort, now here's, how, here's, the, here's the kind of guys they are, okay? Are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women? Laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. It's kind of funny, in the old days, I'm sure they had to literally creep in. Now they just flick on the boob tube and there it is. They're there. There's 25, 30, 40 channels of them. And, and they, they're seduced by it. You see, if you don't have a clear knowledge about how to give under grace, you shouldn't give. I had a guy come, and he, he kept trying to give me money, okay? He was coming to the shop wanting to give me money and for the ministry. And I said, no, I'm not going to take it from you because you don't understand anything about what I'm teaching. And he, had, he, he did not understand that, okay? And I said, you think you're under the tithe, and you just want to give me your tithe. I said, I'm not, I don't take a tithe. We don't offer a way for you to give us a tithe. We don't give you a tenth, or we don't take from you a tenth. 
because we don't stipulate it's to be a tenth. And you know why he was really given? Because he's sick. He's messed up and he's sick. And he's been through all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and over the course of a two-year period, I really had some, I made a lot of progress with him. But right now, uh, it, it's one of those things to where he has finally understood about giving under grace. Haven't seen him at all, okay? <laughs> and that's why you're not supposed to do what I'm doing right now is because it scares people away in, in this sense. It doesn't scare them. If you and I were to go to one of these churches and he tried to fleece us, we'd be scared and want to leave. But what it does is it relieves them of the responsibility, puts it on their shoulders as an honor issue, and since they have no honor yet because they haven't learned about it here, it's just like putting the, 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 the Cokes in the fridge with a can and say, here, put the quarter in. You'll never get enough out of that can to pay for those Cokes, ever, okay? Now, sometimes you will because people that know about that will go put 10, 20 bucks in there to take care of it. But I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the people that go to the, get the paper and take three papers out and put a, put, put a quarter in. I saw a guy come right on my street. He's walking down the thing. He had a whole bunch of papers in. I'm thinking, did he pay for all those? I wonder. It's the honor system, isn't it? And the honor system is something that's not understood by a world of dishonor. And when the leadership and the teachers and the preachers are living their lives openly on television and, and in the press and all this, and they're guilty of not only filthy lucre, but other things beyond that. It makes you wonder, why in the world are we listening to these people? Well, welcome to Suncoast. We don't listen to them. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that they're not, their ministries aren't valuable in some ways, because they are. They are valuable. Many of the Many of the opportunities for a young lady that I was just mentioning a while ago about the domestic violence problem, she could get help at a church right here. There's several of them that would help her. There's one right down on the corner. You can go down there and get a loan. The lady behind me at the, at the, at the uh, store down there, she went to that church. She, she, her, her apartment was right at stone's throw from that church on the corner. And she, get, she got in financial trouble. She went over there and got a loan. They got money. They loan money to their, you know, and they got a food bank, and they got all this stuff, and they've got, they've got the thing for the child care, and they got all this, but they've also got a woman preacher. They didn't at that time. But the point is, they are very much into social help for people. You know why they do that? Because they believe it, because it's coming from over here, but it's hard to speak against that, isn't it? We don't want to speak against that. But what we don't want them to do, what we don't want them doing is, is telling people when, when we live over here in the dispensation of grace, is the more you give, the more you're going to get from God. Because you're going to get it, you get everything you've ever, you're ever going to get from God, you've already gotten. It's all in Christ. And if you don't work and save enough money to pay your electric bill, they will turn it off. And God will let them. Right, Laura? Absolutely. <laughs> Right? So that's the way life is. If you want reality, boom, smack in the face. There it is. But that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. What it means is God says for you to work. As he tells everybody in 2 Thessalonians, if you don't work, you don't eat. So that's not the all things in common program. That's not the, the, the percentage of tenth and, and then another 28% of crops and all the other stuff they gave under Israel's program. That... That right now, right here, is absolutely no limitation whatsoever. There are no limits. But, but what we find is people, they get so up to here in debt that they don't have to give. Okay? And so they will, well, I'm okay because I just don't have any extra. Listen, if you sat down with anybody with any brains financially, look at what you're doing, you'd say, you know what? You got tons of money to give. You just can't access it. It's not a good thing 
to give the wrong way. It's bad. It's a bad thing. It's, you've got to learn how to do this because it's right to do it. But it's also bad when there's nothing to give also. When the widow came with her mite and she had that little bitty coin, that's all she had, her last coin. Instead of going and buying breakfast with it, what she does, she puts it in the pot. And the Lord says, that's how you give. See? So giving is not a, uh, a thing that's supposed to scare you or put you under some sort of legalistic system. It's not supposed to teach you that God's going to give you more and more and more like a dividend check or whatever. It, it is designed to show you how to, as a mature adult in Christ, Handle your finances, because it will directly affect you. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks about uh, the reason you work is so that you may have to give to him that needeth. Okay? And, and that way, you can learn how to support the ministry. By the way, this, the Corinthians did turn it around and start helping Paul, and they did make a promise to do so, but it took them a year to make good on the promise. And Paul had to write them and remind him about it in 2 Corinthians. And then he says, uh, by the way, uh, you don't have to hang on to that until I get there. I'm sending somebody to get it. <laughs> and he tells the other folks that he says, and when I come, he says, we're not making any collections when I come. We're not wasting our time doing that. You have the money collected and in the bag. You know who told them that? Paul, as the courier, told them that who took that money from Antioch to Jerusalem and going and getting more and bringing it down. You know, they were glad to see him for probably many, many months when he'd show up with that money. And when they had the council at Jerusalem, do you remember what they told him that he wanted the Gentiles to do in his ministry among the Gentiles? He says, make sure they're forward to remember the poor. And Paul says, we were, we were definitely able to do that, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for giving hearts. We thank you for those who love your ministry enough to support it. And we thank you, Lord, that while we are in a battle, we are in a spiritual battle, uh, these things that we do in life in a natural world do require resources. We thank you, Lord, for those who give willingly and cheerfully on a regular basis so that these things may carry on. We thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, we will see you here next week.